So Genesis chapter 42, verse 1, the Bible says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? Uh, Jacob, he sees that there's grain in Egypt. Remember, that's what corn means. So Jacob says to his sons, uh, Why are you looking at each other? So in other words, why are we wasting time staring at each other? Sometimes that line is still used. It's funny how in the BCs, uh, that line is still used if, a, if people are just sitting down doing nothing and you want to get down to business, a person will say, why are we just looking at each other? Come on, get up and let's go, right? That's still used to this day. Yeah. So that's something that's been carried on from the BCs, which is interesting. Verse 2, and he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. So Jacob says, uh, Hey, remember that's what behold means. I have, uh, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. I want you all to get down over there. That's the idea of thither. <clears throat> and buy us the grain from over there. That's the idea about thence. So that we can live. We don't die. Verse 3, in Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. So Joseph's ten brothers go down to Egypt to buy grain. However, the youngest uh, brother, Benjamin, and Benjamin is Joseph's brother, remember, Jacob would not send him along with the other brothers. Because Jacob was telling himself, otherwise, perhaps, because that's what peradventure means, remember, something bad can happen to him, can befall him. You might recall Joseph and Benjamin are from his favorite wife, children from his favorite wife. So now that Joseph's gone, Benjamin's all he's got in the world, Jacob is so much in years, so that paranoia is controlling him. So he's not going to let Benjamin go. Verse 5. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So uh, Jacob's son, Jacob's name is also known as Israel. They went down to Egypt to buy grain, and they were amongst those that also came down to Egypt to buy grain. Why is that? Because all throughout the land of Canaan, the verse says, everybody was suffering the famine, so that's why they all came down to Egypt, and Joseph's brothers was in line with those people. Verse 6, and Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. So Joseph was the governor of the land of Egypt, and he was the person that sold the grain to all the people throughout the land. So Joseph's brothers come down, and they bow down themselves before Joseph. So their faces are on the ground to the earth. That's the idea. Verse 7, And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph, he sees his brothers, and he recognized them. However, he didn't say, Hey, brothers, good to see you. No, he acted like he didn't know them, like he was a stranger to them. And he even uh, spake roughly. He used hard words on them. He was rough on them. He said, uh, Where did you come from? And then the brothers respond, we come from the land of Canaan to buy food. Verse 8, and Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. So Joseph, he recognizes his brothers, but his brothers do not recognize him. They don't know him. Then, at that moment, Joseph remembers the dreams that he dreamed a long time ago. Because in verse 6, the, his brothers are bowing down before him. So remember, uh, they had their own stack. Remember, they had their own uh, stack of grain or barley or sheaf that bowed down before Joseph. That was uh, his dream. 
So he's seeing that dream fulfilled in the land of Egypt. He remembers the dream. And then he says to them that you're spies. You came here to spy out our land. The nakedness of the land meaning that it's wide open. So there's no covering, no boundaries. So you came to see all of our private things throughout our land. That's what you came here for. Verse 10, and they said unto him, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. So uh, Joseph's brothers respond, No, uh, my lord, we, that's not what we came here for. We came here just to buy food. We're your servants. Now, Joseph's brothers would sooner hang themselves and say that uh, many years ago, right? But here they are talking like that in front of Joseph now. Uh, it takes years, and the Lord will humble you. Uh, you may be stubborn now, but years later, uh, you will yield to God. You will yield to God. Verse 11, we are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. So Joseph's brothers res uh, respond that, hey, we all belong to one man. We're his children, meaning their father Jacob. So we're not all from separate people, different spies no we're all in one family we're all together here we're all one family we're honest men we're good men uh we're not spies at all your servants are not not spies at all verse 12 and he said unto them nay but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come and they said thy servants are 12 brethren the sons of one man in the land of canaan and behold the youngest is this day with our father and one is not so Joseph responds to them, no, you, he insists you came here to spy out the privacy, the private parts of our region. That's what you came here for, to see everything. The brothers respond, no, your servants are 12 brothers, and we're repeating again, we're insisting, they're insisting here, we're the sons of one man, Jacob, who live in the land of Canaan. And uh, look, our youngest brother uh, to this day is with our father, and the other brother is not. So he, the other brother doesn't exist. So Joseph, when he hears that, he's, you could, <laughs> he's probably feeling a little bit upset, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the brothers don't tell him what happened to that other brother because uh, too much of their pride or protecting their reputation is still in the way. They haven't repented fully yet. They haven't repented. Verse 14, so Joseph, hearing that, I don't think he's happy, so he insists at verse 14 in a rough way. And Joseph said unto them, that is it that I spake unto you, saying, ye are spies. So you can tell from this language when Joseph, he, he's upset by that comment at verse 13, and one is not. So Joseph answers, that is it. That's the idea, right? It's what I told you before. You're spies, I'm telling you. So it's as if that line was what triggered him. So he's insisting on what he told them before that you're spies. Verse 15, hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Meaning that uh, Joseph is saying, this is how you're going to be proved. So you're going to be tested. You're, you can prove yourself to be innocent. So he's swearing by the life of Pharaoh. That's a metaphor. So he's swearing by him, basically. By Pharaoh's life, you're not going to get out of here, hence, back to your homeland, unless provided by, except if your youngest brother comes over here that's the idea of hither verse 16 send one of you and let him fetch your brother and he shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether there be any truth in you or else by the life of pharaoh surely ye are spies so joseph says i want you to send uh, one of you brothers uh, one of you guys to go back to your homeland and to uh, fetch your brother. Now notice that that's a modern word. That's not an old English word, fetch. Uh, like you, you still say to your dog, go fetch. Yeah. So you don't, need, uh, you don't need to understand that. That's pretty obvious. So one of them is going to go out and get the youngest brother, Benjamin, 
And then the remaining brothers, Joseph insists, the, the remainder of you are going to stay in prison so that your words can be proven, can be tested, if there's any truth in you or not. But if you're not going to follow these conditions, then by the life of Pharaoh, I'm going to bet, bet you that you're really spies. Now, from what we see in this case, uh, go to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. This is a great passage. The next chapters that you're about to read is a great passage that refers to a sinner who refuses to come uh, for the need of the Savior. Who refuses to come for the need of a Savior. Now, uh, the problem nowadays is that uh, there's a uh, false gospel, which is called uh, easy believism or quick prayerism, either or, I don't care what you want to call it. But uh, you have to be careful of these two doctrines. Now, I hesitate to use these words because I believe that uh, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is easy. It's Amen. simple. Yes. But... The reason why I'm using these terms is because they're the most common, so I'll be using that. But easy believism and quick prayerism, the idea is like you watch Joel Osteen after he preach, then uh, he always gives that sinner's prayer at the end and then says, repeat after me, and then everybody does that, and then uh, all of a sudden, you're done. So we believe you're born again, you're saved. No, that's not how it works because Joel Osteen, he never addresses sin here. And here they are, uh, people expecting that they can believe on a personal Savior, Jesus Christ, for their salvation without repentance. So, in other words, the first step in the gospel, it doesn't go B.C., all right? That means you're in old times. It's A.B.C. That's the idea. What is A.B.C. in soul winning? Uh, B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. C, confess with your mouth. But see, they're only doing those two things. They don't do A. What's A? Admit you're a sinner. You have to confront your sin problem, your sinful condition. Unless you recognize that first, then you can believe on Christ for your salvation. Amen. Remember this, when you're soul winning to people, you don't start out with Jesus dying on the cross. You always start out with you're a sinner. And because of your sin, you're going to burn in hell. But people refuse to see that. People refuse to accept that. They just want to see that they're a good person, they're okay as they are, and they can believe on Jesus Christ. Why? Just because they want to, not because they need to. They have to realize they are in need of a Savior. What is Jesus Christ saving you from? He's saving you from your sin. So how can you believe on Him, receive Him for your salvation to save you if there's nothing to save you from? So it's so important repentance is so essential for salvation. Now, you have to avoid the other extremism, which is lordship salvation. Basically, the idea is that if we don't see significant changes in your life and you're still messing around with certain sin problems and you're not saved, then you're putting, a, uh, lim you're putting your own limits on how much is repentance, how much is considered salvation, how, how many sins you can keep, how many sins you can't keep. So I don't, I don't like that, obviously. So that's heresy itself. But I'm not addressing that heresy right now. I'm addressing this one. So repentance is so important. People's got to recognize their sinful condition. Without that, then you are not saved. That's important to understand. Without that, then you are not saved. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 2 right here. Romans chapter 2. Now the Bible points out the importance of repentance in verse 4, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. All right, so uh, you've got to repent. Why? If you don't repent, this is the opposite of repentance, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So notice right here, uh, impenitent heart, right? Hardness, that's the idea of no conviction over your sin. So if there's no conviction over sin right here, then you're lost for hell at verse 5. 
But the opposite of no conviction is conviction, right? Which is verse 4, repentance. So see, repentance then means a conviction over uh, your sinful state. Uh, without that, then you cannot believe on Christ for your salvation. That's important to understand. Now, notice the perfect picture right here. This is a really, these are really good chapters of today's day and age. People are without repentance. Unrepentant, godless sinners who think that they can believe and do whatever they want with Jesus Christ. Why? Because they grew up in it? Because they choose to? Because it's a preference? No, it's because you have to and you need to. Otherwise, you'll split hell wide open. That's today's society. Church is an option. It's a game. It's because I want to. Uh, they try to bribe people into church with gimmicks or prosperity gospel or love. Love. It's all about love. Connecting with social programs. No, that's not the case at all. Uh, people have lost their genuine Christianity. Now, uh, when we come to this passage, Joseph's brothers are like that. They committed the atrocity against Joseph by selling him off as a slave, by being so wicked that they lied to their father. And that pictures very well with today's people who sell off, who mistreat Jesus Christ, a type of Joseph, and they lie to the father, God the father. They always lie to their teeth. I'm a good person. No, I haven't sinned. Oh, I don't deserve hell. You're lying. You're lying. You, you know that you sure deserved hellfire and brimstone. Yeah, no. If I'm going to be honest, I definitely deserved it. That's right. I definitely deserved it. We have to understand here that Joseph's brothers, they come down expecting that, oh yes, I will receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Why? Because that's a saying nowadays. Did you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, but a lot of people don't know what that means. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just terms that they heard about before. Yeah, you know what that means? Obama even said that. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Hogwash, man. <laughs> Hogwash. Only him and God would know, but me, if I had it my way, I don't think so. <laughs> the point is, is that people are just saying that nonchalantly. They don't even know what that means. All right, why did you come uh, to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Because of your sin problem, your sinful condition. You need Him to save you from your sin, and that's a personal thing between you and God. That's a personal thing that changed your whole life. Joseph's brothers right here, they come to Zaphnath Paneah. That's Joseph's name, right? His name means Savior of the world, Zaphnath Paneah. Here are Joseph's brother. They come down and, oh, I receive something. I receive something from the Savior. I receive this as my personal Savior to Joseph. But you know what? Joseph would have none of that. You know what he starts out with? He starts out with, hey, you got a sin problem. He confronts them first. He doesn't accept them like that. He confronts their sin first. He doesn't accept them like that. So that's so important right there is that jo Joseph's brother, they come and Joseph is not like, oh yes, I will receive you because I'm lovey-dovey Jesus. No, Joseph is like, no, you got something that offended me and you need to recognize that. But they refuse to recognize it. They're in denial. You notice how they're in denial? This is very good stuff right here. This makes really good preaching. Yeah. So let's uh, start off right here at Genesis chapter 42. Keep your hand at Romans 2 because we'll go back here. But start off at verse 8. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. So notice that Joseph recognized his brothers, but they don't know who he is. Now go to John 1. John 1. Now, Jesus Christ came down to save mankind, but mankind refuses to recognize him. See? So, before God can even confront the sinner of his sin and say, you got a sin problem, there's something else that's before that that people don't recognize. The reason why God is confronting them is because they, uh, 
they chose not to recognize him to begin with. They chose not to know God to begin with. And that's why God has to later say to them, hey, you got a sin problem and confronts them. So let me repeat again, before God confronts the sinner of their sin problem, the steps is first, the steps is first is the sinner doesn't recognize God. They have to realize that. That's the reason why they're confronted later on. Recognizes uh, they do not. They do not recognize God. Then, after that, let's see right here. One. Yeah. And then two. Sinner doesn't recognize God, and then God confronts the sinner. Now, isn't that true? Before you uh, have the Lord speak through you to confront the sinner, before that even happened, they didn't know God. They didn't recognize God. So notice the steps right here matches very well with a, uh, with a typical sinner and the Savior. Picture of Joseph's brothers as sinners with Joseph picturing the Savior. Very good picture here. John chapter 1. It starts out with not recognizing God first before they're confronted. John chapter 1, notice right here, verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world, what? You am not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. That's how it starts out with. Then you go to Romans 2. Okay, go to Romans 2. Your hand's over there, right? So, Notice the context has to do with repentance right here, right? Has to do with repentance right here. So look at Romans 2. But before we go to Romans 2, uh, let's see right here. We're going to go to Romans 3. We'll go back to Romans 2 later, but I want you to go to Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. Notice that the Word of God reads in Romans 3.11... Romans 3.11, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Notice right here that they don't recognize God. They don't seek after God. What's the context? God confronts them. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Famous verse. That's the verse you usually start out in soul winning. Yes? Why? You're confronting them of their sin problem. So notice that they don't recognize God. And then notice right here after that, that God confronts them of their sin problem. At Romans 3.23. For all have sinned then come short of the glory of God. But then this is very interesting. What does the sinner do? They say, oh yeah, you're right. Uh, let's go on to Revelation 21.8 and then Romans 5.8-9. No, the sinner don't do that. The sinner... Before you can finish off Romans 3.23, they insist and they cling on to their self-righteousness and they think that they have no sin issue. They think that they don't deserve hellfire. You know what they do? If you look at verse 9, they're confronted, right, with their sin? They're confronted with their sin. But verse 10, they say, no. And they plea their innocence right here. They plead their innocence. What's their excuse? Their excuse is, oh, but my family, we were raised Baptists. We were raised Christians all our lives. If you look at verse 11, right? Using family background. Oh, I knew Jesus all my life. I have a personal relationship with God. Like I said, this is the mindset of people. When they do easy believism or quick prayerism, uh, you'd be shocked. It may not be the believism or the prayerism that you think. It's more so of a mental thing. It's not that they actually believed on Christ and did the sinner's prayer. It's more so of, when I confront these people, it's more of, because I always lived like that. Yeah, that's good. I always had that in my mind. I don't know. I mean, if you don't tell me a time and place or, a pro, uh, or an incident, if you can't tell me a background or a story of what 
Uh, what led you to receive Christ for your salvation? Can you tell me the details of that story? You may not remember perfectly. I'm not asking anyone to remember perfectly, but you should know how you got saved, the incident that led you to salvation. If you don't know, you know what the big chance is? You never did. You never did. But people who insist that they did, but they cannot tell you the incident, is because it's all in their head. They just have it all in their head. Oh, I always had it in my head. I always had it in my mind. I always See, that's a, that mental stuff that you got to uh, beware. That mental stuff you got to beware. Yeah. So that's the problem with people nowadays is that, well, they use their family background. My family were always Christians. My dad was a pastor. My mom was a pastor of a Christian church too, and she spoke in tongues. And look... You can say all of that that you want, but your family background is not what led you to salvation. I thought it's actually receiving Christ for your salvation. I thought it's actually believing on Christ for your salvation. How come I don't hear that out of you? How come I hear I was raised from a family of Christians? Yeah. See, you know what you're depending on your salvation? Your family background. Yeah. Right. That's what the sinner does. They try to use their family background. Uh, notice right here when we go to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, verse 9, notice that your family background cannot work. Jews tried to do that, right? Why well, come from the family of Abraham? That's what the Pharisees said to Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ didn't recognize their family background, and he instead said, ye are of your father the devil. So look at verse 9. What then, are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Yeah. So your family background don't matter because you're all sinners. Now keep your hand there and go to Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Keep your hand there, Romans 3. Go to Romans 5.12. If you want to boast about your family background, there's nothing much to boast about. Yeah. Jews can go all the way back to Abraham, but you go further back than that, you go further back than that. You go back to Adam, yeah. who sinned, and because of his sin, it passed down throughout all the family tree. You use your Christian parents as your family background for your salvation. Hey, friend, shocking news. Your family tree goes further back than that. So you can't depend upon your Baptist or your Christian Good. family. It goes further back. It goes back to Adam, Amen. the one who actually sinned and passed on his sin to you. So you are lost and headed for hell, Baptist or not. So look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon, notice right here, what? All men, for that all have sinned. Why? Because of one man's sin, Adam. All right, keep your hand at Romans 3 again. Now we're going to compare this with Genesis 42, some of the wordings here. This is really good stuff here. You'll notice that in verse 13, 13, they rely on a handicap. Verse 13. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, oh, they use Benjamin. The youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. They use a handicap. Why? Oh, don't be mean to us. We got our youngest brother back at home, and we lost another brother who died. Hey, fool, you're the one who uh, sold off that other brother or killed him. You know what that is? That's stinking liberalism today. The left-wing mindset is that, see, they think they're good. There's nothing wrong with them. And then when something bad happens to them because of the wrong decisions that they made in their life, you know what they start doing? they start to use the victimization card, the handicap card. Well, this bad thing happened to me because uh, white people didn't think about, you know, they, they weren't fair to me. I was mistreated and they didn't give me, uh, they didn't think about the poverty, the underprivileged, underprivileged lifestyle that I had. So they didn't give me the benefit that I needed that, no, 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 you ever thought about this? You're lazy. You ever thought about this? You didn't work hard enough. You ever thought about this? It's because of the poor choices you made or because some people in your family, the poor choices they made, and you got a record or something. Now, if that has turned your blood cold or you gotten sensitive, then good, your sin issue must be confronted. Amen. 
Now, do I believe that there's issues, uh, that there is unfairness with minorities? Sure, but it ain't only minorities. It's everybody. Everybody goes through unfairness, but guess what? Not everything you can put the excuse on unfairness. A lot of it goes on you, your responsibility, your accountability. We have lost this in our day and age. It's so easy when bad things happen to you, it's easy to find something to blame. Or if I never had this, this bad thing wouldn't have happened. Oh, really? Then when God answered that prayer and delivered you out of that problem, are you out of the problem or are you still in a problem? You still are. You know why? You won't confront the real issue. What's the real issue? Sin. We all forget that. We pretend sin doesn't exist. Liberals pretend sin doesn't exist. Morals are abstract, relative. Y'all pretend that sin don't exist, and that's the reason why we all suffer this mess. Yeah. Now, if you want to get out of suffering, let's confront the real problem first, right? Not your poor me, poor me, but the real issue first, your sin. Then let's see God solve the other issues in life. And then the unfairness and the mistreatments you go through in life. Then let's see how God can sort that all out later that's on. That's good, brother. Amen. And you and I know that's true and that's right. Until we get, uh, until we repent ourselves first, then all the other stuff gets sorted out. If God sorts out everything and this sin thing still remains, guess what? God can sort it out all he wants to, but I ain't going to bring you paradise or a utopia if that sin still remains. But liberals think they can, right? As long as we have these social, uh, social welfare stuff, the programs right here, uh, Medicare and all that, and a, a more control for the government to keep an uh, eye on everything. And No, 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 no. You can do that all you want, but when sin is never resolved, guess what? You will still have unbearable pain on this earth. Yep. Save the universe. I don't care. Save Mother Earth. I don't care. Guess what? It'll still fall apart if you don't fall, solve your sin problem. Right. You're wasting your tax money right now. Y'all are wasting your tax money right yep. now. Why? Because they won't repent of their sinful condition first. The pride of this people is so amazing. They need preaching. This area needs preaching. This area needs a blowout full of preaching. All right. Enough. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I like it. it's, it's, it's a handicap that they whine, right? So then, uh, that's what the brothers do. Uh, look at Romans 2, right? Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Notice right here that uh, there is no such thing as handicap or using the excuse. Look at verse 1, Romans 2, 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? They think they can with their excuses. But look what God says at verse 15, 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. That's today. That's today. Trust me, if there was no white man existing, the liberals will find someone else to blame. If it was only black people in this world, guess what they would put the blame on? Black people. They would. The problem with people nowadays is that they don't realize this. It's not, it's not a matter of black or white or whatever. It's finding someone to blame that's convenient for you. Yeah, that's right. Think about it. You think politics, okay, the last rant, okay, then I promise. But these are things you have to keep in mind since we live in this area, okay? 
What's the main thing in politics, in both parties, doesn't matter, Republican or Democrat. What's the main thing in politics, why you want to vote for someone, why you want to do that? Both parties believe there's someone to blame. Always. Always. Everybody who votes believes there's someone to blame. So then they want the right leader to rectify the situation. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Everybody who votes already has someone to blame in their mind for the problem of our economy, our government, our nation. I guarantee you that. All right, going back right here. So then that's what they do, but their conscience will bear witness at verse 15. So Romans 2, 16, God will expose it all. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, God will prove them all wrong as sinners. God will not let them go. God will not let them go. All right. Uh, we go right here at verse 17. Verse 17. Genesis 42, 17. And he put them all together into war three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. So Joseph, he puts all the brothers in ward for three days. So he puts them into prison temporarily for about three days. Then Joseph says to them at the third day, hey, I want you to do this and, and live for I fear God. So Joseph uses the excuse because I fear God, I want you to do this. Now, before we continue on, uh, the thing is that's probably on everybody's mind is why is Joseph doing this, right? Why is Joseph doing this? I mean, if I was Joseph, I'd probably, say, uh, I'd probably say to the older brother who's bowing before me, guess what? Do you know who I am? I'm Joseph who you sold off as a slave. And then I'd poke fun at them and then, you know, punish them severely. But Joseph doesn't reveal his identity and he insists on them bringing his youngest brother. So why would he do that? The answer is because of verse 9. Verse 9. Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them. Yeah. So remember the dream that he had? Is that his brothers would bow down before him. But look, his dream's not fulfilled. Why? Only 10 in his family. He remembers in his dream it's his whole family there. And then the youngest brother's not there. So then he realized, I got to get all these sheaves together, and then later on I could get my entire family down into Egypt. So one by one, so that's why he, he's saying, I got to get them all down here. So how can he do that? So then that's one, but then number two, he, he wants to try their heart to see whether they changed or not. Because you'll notice the language right here. He said, verse 15, ye shall be proved, Right? And then you'll notice at verse 19, if ye be true men, right? You'll notice verse 16, your words may be proved. So Joseph, what he wants to do is to see the change in their lives. That's the reason why. He wants to see the change in their lives or if they have always remained the same as they were, the same rotten brothers, Joseph typifies Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ wants is he wants to prove and to see, hey, until you recognize your sinful condition first, then I can give you salvation. That's the thing. He'll never give salvation until the person confronts and recognizes their sinful condition. But a lot of people think they're saved and going to heaven. A lot of wicked, demon-possessed people in this Bay Area think that, after they die, they go to heaven. Funeral after funeral, you hear so many times where people take it for granted, that person's saved and up in heaven. That person's in a better place. That's the mindset of these people. But uh, God doesn't want them to see it that way. God wants to prove them. God wants to prove them and test them. And sometimes, a lot of you know this, why didn't you get saved easily back then? Well, God had to prove you first. You know, what made you, uh, what made you folks easy for salvation? You had to go through a proving period first. That's right. That's right. 
And then when you see the sinful condition around you, the problem of this world and everything, that's why it was easy to come to the Savior and really put your faith on him for your salvation. Wasn't it? Wasn't it for a lot of you? A lot of you were like trying to, when you saw so much sin in this world, it kind of opened your eyes, right? Yeah. Sin in your own life, sin with the people around you, that it opened your eyes, and that's what made you accept Christianity after that. It's easier that way. But it is harder for those who grew up in church, especially Christian churches. It's harder for them to come to salvation, usually. Why? Because they'd grown up in Christianity and church and so much, so they weren't able to go through a proving period with the Lord about their sinful condition. That's why I noticed that uh, the people who make really good members are the ones who actually tasted sin out there. They know what it's like. They confronted already their sin issue, and that's why they're easier to work with in church and they're more committed compared with people who grew up in church and lived a Christian their whole life and then it's harder to convince them to get into church unless the Lord puts them through a proving period. Proving period is so important. All right, let's go back here. So we understand why Joseph did that. He has to prove his brothers. Verse 19, If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. So Joseph says, look, if you're really true, honest men, uh, let one of your brothers stay bound in the house of your prison. So remember, Joseph said earlier, I want one of you brothers to go back home and bring Benjamin back. But now he changes his mind. He says, because I fear God, uh, I want you to do this and live. I'm content with just one of you brothers staying in prison. The rest of you can actually go back home. So he says, uh, I want you to go carry the grain for the famine of your, uh, for your houses who are suffering the famine. But I want you to make sure you bring your youngest brother to me so that your words can be verified. It can be proven and you won't die. And so the brothers did that at verse 20. But be, uh, before the brothers did that, verse 21 gives more detail, all right? The author specifies more what actually occurred. This is good stuff, all right? Uh, really good stuff about how you can see yourself in your life when you're confronted with sin. Verse 21, and they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear Therefore is this distress come upon us. Oh, now they finally admit it. Yeah. Why? They needed a time out in prison. The Lord sometimes has to do that. If he, usually when you confront a sinner with their sin issue, they're like, no, 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 and excuses, right? Then you let them go for a while. Then when you return and confront them again the next time, then they're like, yeah, I, then they concede a little bit, right? Human nature is very funny. The, the instant at reaction of our flesh is to self-preservation. Yeah. Self-preservation. Make us look good. But then until we're by ourselves and the conscience, remember, Romans 2, even though we're accusing or excusing, like Romans 2 said, the conscience bears witness. Yeah. So the conscience is finally working in you and then you're like getting under conviction. If there's one gift God has given to every lost man, woman, and child, no matter how wicked you are, is your conscience. That's right. That is a gift from God. But you notice how the devil is defiling that conscience. How you defile that conscience is repetitive actions of the lust of the flesh and higher education. That's how you can get rid of your conscience. Why? Because you always rationalize your, rationalize your actions and you feel, you sense, you're so used to the wrongdoings of your actions. Okay. Returning here, verse 21, explaining each and every word. So then the brothers said to each other, hey, we are surely, that's what verily means, we are certainly guilty 
concerning our brother Joseph, because we saw his soul in anguish. That's the metaphor, meaning that we saw him in pain. And when he sought our help, that's what besought us mean. When he was seeking after us, he uh, wanted help from us, and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us? So we wouldn't hear him out, and that's why this calamity, this distress, is now on us. Verse 22, And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. So Reuben rubs it in, because remember, Reuben, he was the one that didn't want Joseph to be sold off. He wanted to try to rescue him. So Reuben answers his brothers, didn't I tell you, don't sin against the child, Joseph? But you want to hear me out? Now, because of this, look, his blood is required. That's a, that's a phrase which you know what it means, that metaphor, his blood is required. Meaning that if you sh kill somebody, equal payment in return. You reap what you sow. Verse 23, and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. So the brothers didn't know that Joseph understood every word they were saying because Joseph was speaking to his brothers through an interpreter. Meaning then, the, the brothers assumed Joseph, uh, they assumed Joseph did not understand what they were saying in Hebrew because they thought that Joseph was an Egyptian. So when Joseph was speaking to his brothers earlier, what that means is, is that he was, Joseph was speaking in Egyptian, and then he had an interpreter or a translator translating what he said to the brothers. That's why the brothers had this assumption that Joseph doesn't know what we're talking about. Amen. So that's what happened throughout all that time. So Joseph never spoke to his brothers uh, directly by himself. He always had an interpreter with him. Verse 24, And he turned himself about from them and wept, and returned to them again, and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. So Joseph, he turns about face away from his brothers and starts crying. Because you can imagine he was angry and upset at first, right? But then he puts them in prison for a while. What do you think Joseph's feeling? He's recalling himself being in prison. He knew what that was like. So he's getting sympathetic. That's why in verse 18, Joseph instead says, okay, okay, I, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of a break here. I'll just keep one of you in prison. So he felt bad about that. But what's even uh, heavier for him is that, so with this, uh, st uh, this anger that's still against his brothers that's uh, calming down, now he hears his brothers, every single word, what they say in Hebrew, so he's recalling his mother tongue back home. So he's thinking about his home now, and he's hearing his brothers saying, we're guilty, we're re reaping what we sow because of the wrong things, the sin that we have committed. This is our fault. And when Joseph hears that, he's being torn up inside, see? Yeah. So that really gets to him because he's hearing them say that, blaming each other, getting upset, and then feeling guilty. That really gets to him. That really gets to him. So then, uh, after he cries, at the middle of verse 24, he uh, returns to them again, and then talked to them, and then he took Simeon away from the brothers, uh, bound Simeon right in front of uh, their eyes so that they could see it. Verse 25, Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way, and thus did he unto them. So Joseph commanded that their sacks uh, would be refilled uh, with grain and that, uh, sorry, I just lost my place here, and that uh, this is interesting. He restored their money, all right? And he put, restored their money, put it back into their sack. He also gave them provision for the way. For the long journey, he's making sure that they have enough to survive the road, and that's how he treated them. Okay, so the sinner real, uh, starts to get convicted. Sinner gets convicted over sin. Then uh, we see... 
the next step of what occurred. Joseph's make sure that they get their money back. So I want you to go to the book of Acts 8, Acts 8, and then Romans 6. Uh, no, no, Ephesians 2 and Acts 8, excuse me. Ephesians 2 and Acts 8. So Jesus Christ is the bread of life, correct? All right, so money can't buy uh, the bread of life, my friend. Money can't buy the bread of life. So then the Savior says, no, I don't want your money. Now, you notice that this picture so much of our world today. Yeah. You know, they're the wicked world. They refuse to recognize their sinful condition. On top of that, they don't even do easy believism. They're like, no, I'll do it my way. I have my own money's worth. Let me buy salvation. I have my own way of doing things. No, my friend, you got a pride issue. That's the problem with step number one and step number two in salvation is your stinking pride. You refuse to recognize your sinful condition. You even refuse to believe on Jesus Christ easy believism way. Yeah. Why? Because of your pride. All right, so salvation cannot be bought, my friend. All right, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. You might say, why? Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9 says salvation is a gift. Cannot be bought. You don't do anything yourself. You don't do anything yourself. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Why? Because of verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast. Everyone's boasting. Everyone's boasting on what they did, what a good job they've done. And if you go to Acts 8, Acts chapter 8, notice uh, we got verse 18. Somebody's trying to buy the Holy Ghost. Acts 8, 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now, how did you get the Holy Ghost, my friend? It was simple. You just believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. You didn't pay for it, right? This person thinks he can buy the Holy Ghost. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because, look at this, thou hast thought that the what? Gift? of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy what? Wickedness. wickedness. God calls that wicked, my friend. God calls you wicked for buying God's gift. <laughs> How about that? How about that? I don't know about your Asian family, but from the Asians that I see, nothing's more offensive to them than when they give you a gift that you dishonor them by saying, no, I'll do it my way. Go to Genesis. Go to Genesis 42 again. Right? It's dishonorable, actually. It offends them. If they sacrifice something greatly to give you a gift, but then you outright rejected it, or you bought it your own way. Nothing can be more offensive than that. Okay, returning back to Genesis chapter 42. And then uh, let me go this side. That way the people can see what's going on over here. Let me know if I'm cut off, all right? And they laid their asses with the corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the end, he espied his money, for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. All right, so in verse 26, they... Uh, so the word laded means they loaded, all right? They loaded their donkeys with grain, and then they left from there thence. And then one of the brothers opened up his sack to give his donkey. Uh, provender is at animal fodder in the inn that they were staying. And then he espied, which means discovered. He found out. He saw money. Lo and behold, it's in the sack's mouth, the sack's entrance. So when Joseph restored their money at verse 25, verse 27, the brothers didn't know that. So then what do you think the brother is thinking? Verse 28, And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? So then one of the brothers who found his money in his sack told his brothers, Hey, my money is restored. 
Uh, low, look. That's the idea of low. It's in my sack here, look. And then all the bro brothers' hearts failed them. So they got a heart attack. They were all scared, and they were saying one to another, God, what are you doing to us? They know they're reaping what they've sown. Verse 29, And they came unto Jacob their father unto the land of Canaan, and told them all that befell unto them, saying, Yeah, they must be scared. So they went back to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, and they told him everything that happened to them, that befell unto them. And they said these words, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us and took us for spies uh, of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. All right, explaining every word here. They told him, The man who is the Lord of the land of Egypt, he was rough with us since uh, he took us as spies of the country. And then we said to him, no, we're honest men. We're true men. We're not spies. We are 12 brothers. See, they use this family background excuse as always. We are 12 brothers, sons of one man, our father. And one brother is uh, no longer with us. The youngest one is to this day with our father back in the land of Canaan. Verse 33, and the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me and take food for the famine of your households and be gone and bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you your brother and ye shall traffic in the land. All right, meaning that the man who is the Lord of the country says to them, this is how I'm going to know that you're true honest men. I want you to make sure you leave one of your brothers here uh, with me. Then take the food back uh, to your family, your households, because of the famine, and feed them, and be gone, get out of your way, and make sure you bring back your youngest brother to me, then I'm going to know that you're not spies, but that you're honest, uh, true men, and then I will deliver you your brother. So Simeon, I will uh, free him from prison, and you'll be able to buy and sell. That's what traffic means. It's like uh, merchandise, all right, business. You can buy and sell in the land of Egypt. Verse 35, and it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. This is even worse, all right? So it turns out then only one of the brothers, this, uh, only one of the brothers' money was thought to be restored. But then when all the brothers opened their sacks, they realized, hey, all of us got money in our sack, not just our one brother here, all of us did. And they did that right in front of their father's face. Yeah. So he's got all this grief. Yeah. You thought Joseph, uh, the, the lie, the story with Joseph being killed was grievous enough to Jacob? This is worse. Mm -hmm. Jacob is really reaping what he's sown as well. Oh, yeah. With lie after lie after lie and grief after grief. So self-explanatory, verse 35, it just so happened to be that when they emptied their sacks, so then they start to empty their sacks, they dump out the grain, and then uh, lo and behold, that's the idea, every man's uh, bundle of money, so the bundle, that's the idea that money is inside the smaller bag, and it's tied up like a bundle, that's, uh, this smaller bag was inside their bigger bag, which is their sack of grain, and uh, when the brothers and their father saw the bundles of money, then they got scared. Verse 36, and Jacob, their father, said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. So J uh, Jacob, their father, cries out to them. He says, uh, you've taken away. Bereaved means like to take away the children. He loses children. You've, uh, you've robbed me, you've taken away my children from me. Joseph is no longer with us. Simeon is also no longer with us. And you want to take away Benjamin from me. Everything is against me. So uh, Jacob is in grief right here. And this is where we will end. So we can see from this passage that there's a lot of reaping and sowing on both Jacob and his sons reaping what they've sown. Now, this is a, let this be a valuable lesson, is that that's how wicked and strong sin is. 
You do not want to play with sin. Enjoyment truly is a season, but payday is long term. Right. It's not worth it. So good advice is start right, sow right, and you can reap right long term. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing uh, to our hearers. We look forward uh, to more things from the story of Joseph about sinners in need of a Savior. There's so many gleanings to be made still, and I pray that what we've learned today was good enough and that we get a better understanding and idea of the sinful nature of man, how people around us, how they feel and how they think, and how we can work with them how we can deal with them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.